what you are looking at here, those of you who are face to face and what you'll see in just a minute as soon as that light bulb comes on, uh, is you're seeing a video conference technology quite a bit like Zoom or Teams uh, or uh, any of the other ones that you use. But here the difference is uh, notable in a few other ways. This is a technology called Shindig. Uh, and we're using this for the future transform. So let me just explain. Right now, if you look on the bottom, ah, good, this is up as well. Um, don't strain your eyes too much, but if you look in the bottom left, you can see the number 40. That means there are 40 people online uh, for this conversation right now. Are any of you online on your laptops or phones right now for this? Okay, now I say you, let me just distinguish. There are now two audiences that have been fused together over the past minute. Um, online, there are 40 people, uh, now 41, from the Future Transform community. These are people all around the world, mostly in the US, all in the academic space. And the people here in this room, why don't you say hello? Say hello. hello. That's a very enthusiastic group of people in the academic chair space. Uh, some of them are academic chairs. Some of them were recently academic chairs and have now ascended. And some of them are on their way to becoming academic chairs. Uh, and if you can call them that, OK, that's pretty good. Uh, and now somebody is praising my tie. That's pretty good. Yes, I, I normally wear a bow tie, but no one can tell. Um, so let me just explain uh, for both the live face-to-face -face audience as well as the audience online. Uh, the Future Trends Forum is an unusual thing in two ways. First of all, we're a webinar that is not your typical webinar. Uh, we use almost no PowerPoint presentations. We don't have any formal presentation at all. I just have a couple of slides up here for the intro and I'll get rid of them. The key thing here is conversation, is discussion between people. That typical session involves one or several great guests, and we have a couple of you who are enjoying me up here in just a little bit, um, and this whole audience. And the audience consists of people from a wide range of institutional uh, backgrounds, uh, from professions. So we have university presidents, we have community college students, we have librarians, faculty, as well as some people academically adjacent, like scholarly publishers and public librarians and that kind of thing. And what we do for an hour is have a conversation about one particular part of the future of higher education. And we've been doing this for seven years. And we've had university presidents talking about leadership. We've had enrollment scholars talking about enrollment. We've had technologists talking about everything from ChatGPT to Zoom. Uh, and the whole idea here is to have a collaborative conversation because we don't think any one person can run the whole show. Um, now, Looking ahead, if you're new to the forum, let me just mention a couple of details. We have a few sessions coming up on decolonizing higher education, instructional design, uh, enrollment updates, uh, AI and academia. And of course, if you'd like to find out more about that, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. Uh, we can only do this help. This is the part where we thank our sponsors. So in New York State, how many people here face-to-face -face in New Orleans are from New York State? You can tell they're not cheering or anything. They're not saying, yay, yeah. We're from New York. I can say this because I was born in New York, so I can say that. Um, but uh, New York, Neiser Net is a nonprofit in New York State that helps at states, colleges, and universities get on very, very fast broadband. Um, and they also do great professional development. So we're grateful to them for their support. And we're also grateful to Shindig because that's the technology I'm using right now. And if you're new to it or if you're all zoomed out, just a quick show of hands in the physical room here. How many of you use a video technology besides Zoom? Uh, which one? Just shout it out. Team. Do, do, do you hear the enthusiasm from people there? <laughs> Teams. <laughs> WebEx. <laughs> the only people excited about WebEx are IT people because it's really, it's really secure. Um, uh, it really is. It's good for that. Um, the way Shindig works is pretty much like the, uh, the normal way that, that video conference tools work, except it has a couple of differences. Um, those of you who are online will see that the screen has two halves. The top half is where people are on stage. Now, I'm literally on stage here, but online, those are people who everyone can see. So it's a kind of central location for video feed. And this is where our guests are going to be in just a minute. Um, but on the bottom half of the screen, which those of you face to face cannot see right now, uh, that is all people, everybody in the audience. Uh, and 
These are, again, people who are from all over the world of higher education. And those of you who are online, if you'd like to uh, say hello to somebody else there, just mouse over them and you can uh, double click on them. If they want to talk to you, you have your own audiovisual bubble. Now, those of you who want to communicate with us in general, face-to-face -face here in New Orleans, you can just shout out your question or I can chuck a mic at you. Uh, and I'll, re I'll paraphrase and repeat your question. If you're online, uh, you can use either at the bottom of the screen, there's a white band running along it that has a few different buttons. One is a chat box. And the chat, if you haven't used it yet, just uh, say hello and where you're from. So I will just right now say, Brian in New Orleans with dozens of people watching me type. Um, <laughs> Now, also for those of you who are online, next to that, uh, next to the chat box button on the bottom of the screen, there are two other buttons. One of them is a Q&A button. That's a question mark. The other one is a raised hand button. If you click the raised hand button, that tells me you want to join us on screen. And if you type in a Q&A into the Q&A box, I will flash it on the screen so everyone can see it. And I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. Uh, we have people from Austin, Texas, from Tacoma Park, from Dallas, from Connecticut. Uh, we have people from uh, Central PA, Houston, Texas. And uh, Washington, D.C., hello, John. Um, Indiana, College Station, Oklahoma. So we've got a pretty good geographical base. And hello, Phil, good to see you. Now, we're grateful to Shindig for making all this technology available. Um, now, pushing ahead a little bit, if you want to get involved with this, uh, we have our archive right now, which has something like 333 recordings on YouTube. So you can just go to tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive. And if you just want to go chronologically, that'll have them all there. But also, if you want to go thematically on the forum website, we have an index uh, broken down for every program by its topic, from AI to pedagogy to professional development to town gown relations. Uh, people also may be interested in our monthly trends analysis, which just came out this week, uh, the FTTE report. You go to ftte.us to download that. And of course, I want to shout out our supporters on Patreon. Uh, these are the fine folks that contribute as little as a dollar a month to keep our machines humming and our lights on. And the people here contribute $10 or more a month. With folks like Laura Gibbs, Paul Henley, Corey S. Yes, and we're grateful to them for their support. Now, this week, this week, our topic is academic chairs and what's happening with that structure as we move forward. Uh, on the course of our research, we've looked at a wide range of topics. Uh, from copyright to academic funding, but we've also looked at a wide range of academic positions, from presidents and provosts. We've also looked at librarians and technologists, and of course, faculty. But here we want to focus in on this topic. What does it mean to be an academic chair in 2023? How is that position changing as the world changes around us? And what can we do to support academic chairs? And how can they support the rest of us? So, uh, Tony, I would like to bring up at least one of our guests, um, there's Terry. Where'd she go? Hello, you're on the other end of the room. So this is now dramatic. We get to bring Terry up. And who's our third? Not Christian, who could make it, but... <coughs> Hello, Jennifer. Hello, nice to meet you. Come on up. This is great. There should be a TV kind of gesture here, right? We would play them to the, you know, with a theme song here. But you don't want me to sing. That would be very, very bad. Oh, and uh, if, if, we, if we could, if, please have a seat and be comfortable. Um, I can turn this a little bit without breaking all the cables uh, so that people can see you. There we go. Hello. Hello. And so these are two of our guests. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some questions. And then as we go, the audience here face to face, and the audience online will have some questions as well. Uh, so if, if I can ask you to introduce yourself by saying who you are, what your title position is or is this week, and then tell us what you're working on for the next year. Okay, me first? Yes, please. Can y'all hear me? So, hey everybody, um, my name is uh, Jennifer Lemoyne and I am the Interim Associate Dean at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Go Cajuns. Um, and in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences, and this is, really exciting for us because it has just been over just been over the last year that we transitioned from the college of nursing and health professions to the college of nursing and health sciences 
And additionally, we were upgraded from the Department of Nursing to the School of Nursing. So very, very exciting time for us. Additionally, the uh, University of Louisiana at Lafayette just received um, our one Carnegie designation. So we have a wow. lot going on at the university. Yeah. Um, my role as the uh, interim associate dean is pretty much to see to the day-to-day -day activities of the college. We have um, nursing, health information management, mm -hmm. and health mm -hmm. services administration. Mm -hmm. In our nursing program, we have traditional undergraduate nursing students. We have our N2BSN online program. We have a Master of Science in Nursing, where we do family nurse practitioner, psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, nurse nursing education. We also have a, a Doctor of Nursing practice program. Wow. And as in your position right now, you have to manage all of that? Yes. And you were, before this, a department chair? So um, before this, I was what we call graduate coordinator, mm -hmm. which uh, mm -hmm. is a chair position uh, for all of the graduate programs within the College of Nursing. Uh, before that, I was the DNP coordinator, in charge of the uh, nursing practice program. And then we have a structure in the college where we also have what's called semester coordinator. So one of the things that makes us so successful is uh, the team of leaders that I work with. Uh, we, we have various positions, different hierarchy, so that one person is not responsible for managing all the faculty and all of the students uh, in the college. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. One last question. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, one observation and question. The observation is here in Lafayette, right? Lafayette. Smack in the middle of the state. Doing what? Smack in the middle of the state. No, no, it is it is actually in the southwest part of the state. Oh, okay, okay. So like Alexandria would be in the middle of the state. That's what I'm thinking of Alexandria. And Shreveport and Monroe at the top. Yeah, I used to teach in Shreveport, so yeah. I got this. Um, now, the question to ask you is what the next year is going to hold for you? I mean, what are some of the surprises, the challenges? What are the big ideas that are top of your mind? So, um, one of, the, one of the challenges that we have right now is where uh, we have accreditation coming up in March, so that's always a stressful time. Next month. Next month, yes. Oh. So accreditation of uh, all of our nursing programs. Um, yeah, so uh, it'll be a challenging time, but we're going to get through it. Um, the other thing that we that we um, have coming up in September is we are one of. Um, I think it's only about 130 um, simulation centers across the world. We are designated as uh, a simulation center um, for medical and nursing education. So we have accreditation coming up for that in September as well. Who accredits that? Oh, IMESH. Okay. And, uh, Please, uh, don't tell me what it, I can't tell you what it stands for. No, it's but, okay. uh, it is an international yeah. um, accrediting body. And again, we're one of 130 in the entire world, That's not just within the United States. We have a, a very robust uh, simulation center. Uh, we have uh, state of the art technology as far as, as uh, intensive care. We have uh, a mom who births a baby. Very, very good activities for our nursing students. Now, knowing nursing students as I do, do the nursing students get to take over any parts of the simulation? Yes. Oh, man. Yes. That can be funny. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, so, um, so those are some things, some, um, I guess, internal things that are going on. Um, we are also in uh, the transition process of uh, Dean Search right now, so that's that's exciting. But you're doing a dean search and accreditation at the same time. Yes, yes. Only, only in Louisiana would we do something like Which that. Which is why you were in, in, in New Orleans. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so I'm originally from New Orleans, but uh -huh. um, live in nice. Lafayette now. The other challenges that we're facing over the next year is, um, of course, we have decreased student enrollment. Um, we historically have had um, very high and flex pass rate which is the national certification um, for RNs. And post uh, COVID, and I hate to keep blaming everything on COVID, but why not, right? Um, we've seen a little bit of a dip 
in our NCLEX pass rates, we are still well above the national average um, for that. Um, so, and we're also seeing a transitional uh, type of student. Has anybody seen a different type of student out there with uh, different learning needs and learning styles and expectations of faculty? So that, that, is, that is a big transition for us. And one of the things um, that we have not had before is um, a student success coach. Mm. And, you know, we, we have more students that have increased levels of a, uh, test anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, field of medicine and nursing is getting more complex. Mm -hmm. Our national accrediting bodies are requiring more and more from us in the way of robust curriculums. Uh, changing to competency-based education over the next couple of years. So all of these new um, new ways of teaching and learning are on the horizon for us. So we're going to have to adapt pretty quickly um, to that. Right. Um, so this academics uh, student success coach, um, we're hoping will help our students overcome some of the barriers that they faced, you know, post-COVID. We're also seeing uh, lower levels of literacy, math, reading, which is um, it, it's it's really a shame because the, uh, you know we, these students are having problems in basic math and and those calculation skills. Oh no! So uh, we do have some works in the Louisiana State Legislature to enhance STEM programs. We also have some funding that will be coming uh, directly to uh, nursing education uh, personnel and uh, educators, as well as uh, funding for, um, I guess, different types of programs, yeah. where second yeah. degree programs to make it easier. Recruiting students in high school, make it easier to transition from uh, respiratory therapy to to registered nurse so that credits are uh, included and we can get um, individuals into the healthcare workforce sooner uh, rather than later. So lots of big things coming up in 2023. Indeed, and you have a lot of sympathy in the chat, by the way, people have said, you're doing all this at once, oh my gosh. Uh, you get sympathy from me as well. We have a really good team. Uh, I've been uh, there for answer. 16 years uh, and a lot of our faculty have been there for 20 and 30 years and plus we have new faculty that I've been mentoring that have less than five years. So uh, we have a very broad range of skill mix um, mm. as well as experience. And um, the other thing we're probably going to be working on is now that we are in R1, uh, we have, of course, we've always had a tenure track and it's, it's been uh, research focused, but uh, we're also going to move to a clinical Clinically mm, focused mm, mm. Uh, tenure track, yeah. and um, really, I guess, I make the research focused tenure track a little more rigor rigorous now that we're in R one. Oh, that makes sense. Thank you so much. That's a fantastic answer, um, and I, I, I'm sure people here will have some questions. Sure. Um, but let me. I'm, 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 hang on. I'm, 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 but I just want to say for everybody who is physically here in New Orleans. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can just raise a hand or you can stand up. And as I say that, one man just raised his hand. That was pretty remarkable. Uh, what, why don't you go ahead and shout your question, and if people here can't hear it, I'll, I'll repeat it. How do you deal with the mental health challenges of nursing students today? Okay, can, can, I just, can I just repeat that? A, a question was, how do you deal with the mental health challenges facing nursing students today? So we've seen more and more which is um, unfortunate. We do have a counseling and testing service that is available um, for all of the students across the campus, not just nursing students. Um, we uh, have another faculty member who um, is in the College of uh, well, Liberal Arts, but Criminal Justice, and he is instituting a program for lay individuals, those who are not nursing uh, or healthcare professions across the campus 
uh, to be able to recognize signs and symptoms of mental health uh, issues, early signs and symptoms, so that in your classroom, if, if you're a math teacher, you may not be well versed in these signs and symptoms of anxiety, mental health, uh, depression. Um, so instructors can uh, go ahead and, and take these classes and be better equipped across the university and do proper referrals. So just a little history about the state of Louisiana. 100% of the state is designated as a health professional shortage area for mental health. 95% of the state is designated as a health professional shortage area for primary care providers. We have a lot of work to do here in Louisiana. But thank you for the question. So when Tony, um, I went to register yesterday and I walk up to registration and Tony says, Jennifer Lemoyne, we've been talking about you. I can't remember why. And I'm thinking, is <laughs> this not good? That's never a good sign. Do I want to be Jennifer Lemoyne? Because maybe I could you know, sign it with somebody else. And he said, we want you to be a panelist. And I said, I don't know what to expect, but I knew I could deal with a friendly audience. So um, thank you guys for being so, so kind. So far, the so, hour is so still. Far, so far. Well, we have a quick question for you, and then I want to introduce your your colleague. Um, uh, one person asked, "Is there a higher rate of mental health problems, or are we more attuned to mental health issues post COVID?" I think both. both. I, th I think that we are more attuned uh, post COVID, but I also think that we're seeing uh, escalating rates, and in populations that we've not seen before, such as grammar school. Yeah. You know, uh, traditionally, you know, high school and, and college students, we would see it young adults as well. But we're, we're seeing uh, younger, younger individuals across the state. Mm. The other thing we're mm. seeing is uh, geriatric individuals who have not mm. had mm. any contact with families for a very, very long time that may have had a very robust social life. Yeah, I know Mama, we go was her life every Wednesday, right? But she hasn't been able to do that for a very long time. So they're losing their social structure and that's also yeah. increasing rates of depression and suicide as well um, in the geriatric population. Thank you for that great answer. Carly, thank you for that great question. And I'm sorry, what's your name? Jeffrey Merritt. Thank you, Jeffrey. Great question, great question. Now, we have more questions coming up. And by the way, if you're online, uh, again, just either go to the bottom of the screen and just hit the raised hand question, raised hand button if you wanna join us on stage, or hit the Q&A box if you wanna ask a question. Why don't you pass the mic over to our colleague here? Terry, um, I'm gonna try and point the camera at you without getting, there we go, we can see you, hello. So first of all, to bring you on stage, metaphorically, what, um, what is your current title and your name? And uh, tell us a bit about your position. Well, my name is Terry Gatter, and I am the Associate Dean for Academics at Kansas State University's Salina campus. It's our aerospace and technology campus for our College of Technology and Aviation. So um, different fields, but a lot of similarities yes. in what we deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I have actually been a department chair at a private institution for, for many years, actually teacher education background. Go figure that I'm in an aerospace and technology campus. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, but uh, so I've been a department chair, I've been a school director, and now I'm in the associate dean role. Wow, okay, okay. this is fantastic. And um, <coughs> one question to ask is the question I just put to your, your seatmate here. What, what are you looking forward to for the next year? What are the big challenges, the big opportunities, the, the major concepts that are top of your mind? Wow, do we have like five hours? No, <laughs> in, uh, in but we nutshell, have a few minutes. In a nutshell, uh, strategic planning as we look at the future of education and where, where higher ed is, is going to try to be proactive on that um, is, is really important. And strategic planning is no longer 10, 15 year strategic plans. We've got to be flexible, we've got to mm. adapt, mm. and we've got to be able to move and adjust quickly. Um, that's one of the biggest changes that I'm seeing now from where maybe 15 years ago as a department chair. Um, there's been a lot of transition there. So strategic planning is one. 
um, curriculum, reviewing the curriculum that we currently have to make sure it's relevant, rigorous, relational. Um, mm. Those are really important pieces for success. Um, and as, as we plan that, um, one of the things that's top on my mind is partnerships and how we work with others. We cannot do this in isolation at all. Um, even if you used to survive in isolation, if you try to do things in isolation, um, it's going to be a losing battle. So how do we work with our industry partners? How do we work with our advisory committees on the most cutting edge and relevant things that are happening? How do we work with our public schools? How do we work with our Chamber of Commerce and, and promote the regions that we're in? Um, it's collaboration that's going to help us. Somebody mentioned earlier collaboration was important in the session I was yeah, in, and, yeah. and I fully believe that. Oh, thank you. That's a fantastic answer. Um, uh, and I have questions for you, but I want to make sure the audience gets to ask questions. So again, for everybody in this room, just uh, raise your hand. Uh, and if you're online, uh, just either click the uh, raised hand button or click the uh, Q&A button. Uh, and we have a couple of questions, I think, for both of you. So let me just put one of these up right now. Uh, and this is from uh, Tom Hames, who is not too far away from us. He's in the Houston area in Texas. Uh, and Tom asks, do academic departments create artificial silos that undermine the broad-based undergraduate education necessary for thriving in a digital world? What do you think? Take the first Can you repeat that? Then... Yeah, absolutely. Do academic departments create artificial silos that, and let me bring it back up again, that undermine the broad-based undergraduate education necessary for thriving in the digital world? In the digital world. I thought mm. you said the real world, but the digital world. I kind of said both. <laughs> I'll take a first step at that please, because when I please. first went to the Salina campus, um, we had the name Polytechnic, mm -hmm. and it was we were very intentional about working cross disciplinary, cross department. Mm -hmm. That was my role as school director. We brought three different departments together, and so we were very intentional in, in doing that. Which department? Um, we brought together an aviation department an engineering technology department and an art science and business department oh, wow. into one school of integrated studies. Now there's some challenges there, yeah. right? but it was fascinating. And I had the opportunity to work with amazing individuals, very passionate about their own content, but were challenged to work across the aisle, so to speak, mm -hmm. and um, collaborate on, um, we had a structure that forced that collaboration. <laughs> With some challenges, but also it moved us forward as an institution to be able to do some of the very things that we're doing right now. So I think we have to be yeah. careful if we're operating in silos. The natural structure of a hundred year old university structure puts us in that. We have to be intentional to put together ways that we can um, work together. Um, I'll give one example. Please. Manned aviation, we are great at that. We are also one of the first schools in the nation to do, un, it was called unmanned UAS or drones. We're now calling it uncrewed. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, those two disciplinary fields are on a collision course mm -hmm. and they're going to be merged in the future. So to be prepared for that, we can't operate in isolation. Yeah. So we are doing things intentionally now um, and building our curriculum around things that bring us together. Oh, that's a great example. That's a great example. Jennifer, please. So undergraduate nursing is a very specialized field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as far as uh, preparing graduates for the digital world, I mean, we, we do have um, online components to our courses as well as face-to-face uh, -face classroom. Again, the robust simulation lab yeah. environment that we have. We also integrate a lot of um, technology and, and I'm not trying to sell anyone a product, but for right. example, uh, there is a, a virtual health assessment, a product out there called Shadow Health, where um, in the absence of a patient experience in the hospital setting, um, we can, uh, uh, virtual technology uh, can simulate that particular patient experience of the mm -hmm. student will respond to the patient and based on their choices, uh, it'll go down an algorithm where the patient will actually have different outcomes based on their choices. So I do think we use a lot of digital technology. 
Um, our undergraduate nursing students are also equipped to uh, be prepared to go into the workforce that has electronic health records. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have uh, we partner with our uh, HIM department uh, where we have interdisciplinary uh, content taught in courses. We have a course where um, our HIM students will actually work with uh, an advanced practice registered nurse. We have a case scenario, and based on the scenario, they will do the coding and billing, I believe, uh, that is so important yeah. for healthcare. Yeah. So I think we're doing an okay job in wow. digital. I can't speak for all. Um, departments and colleges. Well, it's interesting how you, you, for you, the digital was a way to help cross these boundaries. And then for you, you had a structure uh, in place to help cross the boundaries. This is a, a, first of all, these are great answers. Thank you both. And Tom, as usual, a great, great question. Um, and if you're new to the forum, again, that's an example of a, of a Q&A question. Now I'd like to bring in a video question from our good friend, Roxanne Riskin, who I believe is coming to us from Connecticut. Let me see if I can bring her up on stage. Hi. There she is. Hello, Roxanne. Great to see you. Oh, what a great topic. Well, I can't hear you right now. Um, is your mic off? No. Well, now it is off. Okay. Um, it should be on. Can you hear me? Can no, you I can't pick it up at all. Um, everyone can hear her except me, um, which is a terrible position to be in. Um, um, if um, uh, Roxanne, why don't you ask your question? Okay, um, kids, well, we'll, we'll see. Um, yes. Um, we'll, why don't you ask your question um, and everyone then can hear it. And then why don't you uh, and then um, someone in the chat can quickly paraphrase it in text. Thank you. Um, no. We talked no, about okay. um, how yeah. social emotional learning yeah, could possibly be integrated into um, higher ed and have you um, a model mm -hmm. for that if there is yeah. any yeah, interaction in that area. Any my I took a mindfulness, this is I'm gonna segue. I took a mindfulness course for healthcare professionals. It was a, a short module a couple of years ago at the University of Florida. And I found it fascinating and really helpful for reducing the stress, which you mentioned before. And the other question I have is virtual reality. Have you embarked on any adventures and any learning experience that you find helpful for your students? You mentioned simulation. Our, uh, our AV Ninja just fixed the, uh, the, the problem with a single click. Um, and so uh, you were just talking about social emotional learning and right. how it can be integrated further into higher ed. Right. And is there a model that can be implemented? Okay, um, so that's a, that's a quick question. So social emotional learning, is there a way that we can incorporate that into higher education? <laughs> oh wow! Are you throwing the softball? <laughs> <laughs> Social emotional learning. Wow! How do you unpack that? That is multifaceted. Um, we talk about mental health. Um, that's that's one piece of that. But how do we even train people to recognize um, elements? And we do have pieces of of. Um, self-care that we work into our curriculum mm -hmm. but even um, i don't know i think of social emotional learning I, th I think of all right i'm gonna i'm gonna say this um not that i agree with this but it, a lot of people will say that pilots are um, have their own set of egos mm -hmm. and they don't yeah. always um, maybe understand people from a different field mm. of study so how do we mm. How we help them be open to um, that human element of yeah. people that are different from them. We do have some of those conversations um, and, and helping individuals understand that other people are different and by yeah. using scenarios yeah. Um, yeah. and examples of things that would happen from a human factors perspective, both within the field and across um, the culture of group, uh, groups of people that they'll work with. Um, that's that's a, a great question, and I'm not sure I have it's, a, a yeah. good answer for that. I think all of our society can, can help with that. That's, thank you. That's a good answer. Jeffrey, do you want to add? Yeah, so 
So what we're hearing from our employers on the hospital system is that um, the graduates that are coming out are, are not uh, prepared from a, um, a social mm. and emotional standpoint. They may, they may possess the knowledge and the skills, right. but um, they are not as resilient as graduates mm. that they have seen in the past. And, and I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, particularly in nursing, we're probably a little bit tougher than maybe some of the other colleges, you know, a, a little bit more of a, you need to put your, you know, your big girl panties on yeah. because, yeah. you know, what you're dealing with is life and death. You know, if you make a mistake, you can kill somebody versus I don't know, made their coffee wrong or whatever. So, so we do take a little bit more of um, a tough love approach um, mm -hmm. when it comes to our undergraduate students. But we, we do have, um, over the past couple of uh, semesters, we have a very involved uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee within the college. Um, they have done some wonderful things in the college and across campus. So I think that we are learning to socially accept differences and uniqueness about um, different cultures and individuals um, yeah. more readily than we have in the past. So, who so, so I think that that is progress there. Who leads those workshops or where do they live institutionally? So um, it, the, uh, it's an ad hoc committee that is within the college. It's not a standing committee like a curriculum committee or a program evaluation committee. Um, and we just put it out there to the faculty and we said, hey, is anybody interested? And it is the committee that we have the most representation on from faculty. Huh. We also partner with faculty from other colleges across campus, and there is actually a graduate level um, DEI um, mm -hmm. committee mm -hmm. um, that deals specifically with uh, graduate level education and students. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank the you. The follow up was, are you using virtual reality in any, in any way in your simulations? We do. We do. Um, we have uh, we have something at the university called step grants, and that's uh, fees that are paid. Uh, you, you know, when you get your college fee bill, and there's like a thousand fees that you don't know what they're mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. and you you got you know a nineteen dollar yearbook fee. Nobody nobody reads the yearbook anymore. But nevertheless. There's a student technology fee, and part of that student technology fee goes back into investing in the colleges across the university. And we have recently received an award uh, for a step grant for um, virtual reality, where we purchase the glasses. I believe it is. I don't. I don't know a lot about it because we haven't had the equipment delivered, and we haven't had. Uh, any type of training sessions, but to use that um, in our patient care in addition to our simulation lab. Mm. So, you know, maybe I'll come back next year and let you know how it goes. I'd love to see that. We're really excited about that. And that that is something that came out of our community health um, and psychiatric faculty uh, in, mm. in those semesters because there's not a lot of simulation that you can do out with community settings or um, the psychiatric patient. Yeah. So we're hoping to be able to enhance our learning outcomes and delivery of uh, course content with this virtual reality. I've not seen it, I've not used it, but I'm excited about it. Oh, excellent. That's great. And uh, medicine has always been on the early stage for simulation uh, for really good reasons. Well, aviation was first. I'd say aviation was first. I, I'd, say, I'd say medicine's a little older. But. I will say that we were looking into some of those things as well. So maybe a year from now I can give you some updates. Yeah. Like, for example, our pilots who would take off from central Kansas, and we have the longest runway, over a mile of runway, which is awesome for training aspects, right? Oh, nice. But um, they can fly into any airport virtually. And um, we've done some simulations. 
Um, right. They can talk to Control Tower in Los Angeles, or they can, I mean, be able to use that virtual reality, uh, augmented, augmented reality, mm -hmm. um, and partnerships. Um, we've done some even partnerships um, with the Air Force. So some of those things are fascinating. And so to, yeah. to the question about can we use that um, to help us in these arenas, absolutely. I think we need to figure out a way to do it better than we're doing it, but I think that's a great opportunity. Well, and that was a great answer. Uh, great answer from both of you. Roxanne, as always, thank you so much for the great questions. Thank you. Um, that's an example of a video question. We have a couple of other uh, text questions. And uh, oh, one more video question coming in. This is Adam Maxell. Let me see if I can bring him up on stage. Hello, Adam. Hi, Brian. Uh, thanks for, uh, um, I wanted to follow up on. Adam, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can Adam, you are you me? frozen? Nope. Can you hear me? Adam, your input seems to be frozen. Um, I'll, I'll bring up your text question instead. Um, let's see. Uh, we have the question being, this is following up on Tom's question about disciplines. Let me bring this up on the stage so you guys can see it. Uh, what do universities need to do to facilitate interdisciplinary across departments or even merging departments, especially related to how resources are allocated? So what do universities need to do to facilitate interdisciplinarity across uh, all these silos? Well, I'll start just because I have the experience of forcing it structurally is a way to accelerate that. Um, it's not always painless, but it's a way to accelerate that interactive um, that collaboration. Another thing you can do is incentivize uh, interdisciplinary projects. Um, the scenario that I gave you of um, our AR, VR um, students sitting in Kansas but talking to control towers and taking off and landing in airports across the nation yeah. um, was established in partnership with an aviation faculty and a computer systems faculty working together two different departments initially under the school we were merged together <laughs> brought them in as they were both new faculty at the same time actually but building those relationships and helping those new faculty engage with people from other disciplines, I think is really critical to helping that as well. So those are a few co a couple of ideas. So some of those incentives and, and, and that kind of practice. Yeah, please. So I think for us, it's a little bit different. And what we've done, uh, of, co of course, we have very good working relationships with uh, College of Science, College of Engineering. You know, we. We do try to um, do some interdisciplinary work uh, whenever we can. But in, Lafayette has a very large medical community. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is we have partnered with uh, some of those uh, clinics and agencies to do interprofessional research. And it's, it's been a two way street. Um, for example, you know, I was telling Jared, I just recently graduated from the University of Utah College of Nursing um, with a PhD in nursing. And my dissertation focused on sex-based differences in peripheral artery disease. And what, we, what we've seen historically is that women are disproportionately affected where peripheral artery disease has always been considered a male dominant disease, mm. and we just mm. didn't get it right. So we have um, Cardiovascular Institute of the South, which is the um, the number one uh, cardiology uh, clinic across Southwest Louisiana. And I partnered with their physicians to do a secondary data analysis um, to improve patient outcomes within our community. So that is an example of an interdisciplinary partnership that is not only benefiting that particular clinic, but benefiting patients across Southwest Louisiana and hopefully beyond, and as well as research development for the university. And in turn, that relationship has also fostered some opportunities for our doctoral students to continue research efforts with that institution mm -hmm. and other other institutions uh, within the Acadiana region. So we do seek opportunities wherever we can find them, whether they be across campus or across town um, to foster interdisciplinary partnerships. 
So having these uh, off-campus partnerships is a really key way of doing that. Uh, the off-campus partnerships. And then we also have uh, what we call academic practice partnerships uh, with hospital systems as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Adam, that's a great question. And thank you both for these really useful, inspiring answers. Uh, we have another question coming in from uh, our, friend, our friend Glenn McGee, who I think is in Florida right now. Let me make sure. But uh, Glenn asks this question. Today's Inside Higher Ed Opinion asks, universities should immediately designate an AI task force, ideally at the level of each college or perhaps even each department. How can this be done? So I think this is in response to uh, ChatGPT and other generative AI um, challenges. Like for artificial intelligence? Exactly. Is that exactly. So not, just, not, not the computer science study of AI, but grappling with AI as it impacts individual departments, individual schools. So it's funny that this um, come up because uh, I received an email maybe a week or a week and a half ago from a colleague um, from uh, Creighton University in Arizona saying that, hey, we need to be on the lookout for uh, student papers that are being written mm -hmm. using artificial intelligence. And I had never, I, I knew about artificial intelligence and I knew that there were programs that were in the works where you would put in keywords and an article would be reproduced. But the ones that I had seen, uh, the first ones I saw, I thought that they were written by someone whose first language was something other than English because there were little nuances within the article that just, just weren't right. Mm -hmm. You know, you're saying, Oh, you know, uh, it's a translation issue, but I found out it was an AI issue. Um, but there, you know, I don't know what we're going to do about that. Uh, I do know that there is an individual, and I can't remember the name of the person, who has come up with a program that will be able to detect if the paper or article was written through an AI yeah. mechanism. So I guess kind of uh, revving up, turning in uh, for the next generation. So I do think that that is something we need to be aware of um, as academicians, as, as far as how is AI going to influence the student's work and is it actually the student's work that we mm. are receiving? So how this is a good point. And the, the most popular tool of these is, is ChatGPT. And there are at least two. That's it. That's, there are at least two that's different it. detectors I've seen. Uh, the company that makes ChatGPT, OpenAI, has one. And a Princeton undergrad released another one. Um, but the but interesting question is, is this something which we can say that all academicians should be aware of? But how can we structure that kind of awareness into, say, departments or into divisions? Well, I think it's like anything else that, that comes along in, in education is, you know, we need to uh, make sure that our faculty are aware of it, whether, mm -hmm. whether it is diversity training or whether it is uh, learning about a new curriculum. I mean, this is definitely a threat to the future of academia. So I think it is, is something that, oh my gosh, if I have to watch one more uh video about safe driving while I'm on university time for continued education every year, I certainly think that we can add something in that is required for us to maintain currency with the trends and AI that would affect our institution. Thank you. Thank you. Terry, did you want to? I would just add, um, this is something that's challenging to stay abreast of because as soon as you learn about it, it changes, right? Mm -hmm. That's where technology mm -hmm. is. So being able to be open with our faculty and have spaces where we can collaborate and share ideas is, is really important. So somebody may have already looked into something that they can share with everybody. Um, I, I'm not sure a, a task force mm -hmm. would be the way I would approach it as much as open collaboration and keeping mm -hmm. the topic at the top of uh, mm -hmm. discussion lists that we have. The other thing is our faculty have for several years been talking about um, how do we, and COVID expedite this, how do we uh, structure our assignments so that the students are actually 
demonstrating their knowledge um, and applying mm -hmm. that knowledge mm -hmm. rather than doing papers or uh, multiple choice tests and that type of thing. And so when we're looking at that performance-based outcome, can the student show me physically or do some kind of project that I don't then have to rely on a paper to understand their knowledge? I don't know if the uh, online audience could hear this, but there was some applause from that last point about structuring assignments uh, and assessments that actually Absolutely. reveal student learning. Um, that's a great question, Glenn. Uh, and that was, a, Glenn, I think that was a column that was on the top of Inside Higher Ed this morning. Uh, by the way, we're, we're coming close to the end of our hour. Um, so there's time for everyone to ask another question or to make another comment. We have uh, one, com uh, one question from the uh, online audience, and, and this is from Carly. And Carly continues our exploration of interdisciplinarity um, by asking this, follow up, uh, what can staff offices and faculty departments learn from each other about cross collaboration? So what can staff offices and faculty departments learn from each other about cross collaboration? Why would they ask these hard questions? <laughs> I, I think staff, I, I would say Goodness. staff offices is, is critical. And I'm fortunate to be on a smaller campus, so this is easier than mm. when you are having a very large campus where you might have mm. a five-story building that's all one apartment. Right. So right. in this case, smaller is more efficient in mm. that cross-collaboration by necessity. Yeah. Everybody has to wear multiple hats, so yeah. I'm blessed. Yeah. I don't know if I'm the best one to answer that. No, that was a good answer. I, I know we have. Well, hang, yeah, hang we're, say, we're in the five-story building. When, when, you, when you say small, how many students do you have, roughly? We are about 800 students right now. Okay, very we'll small. We'll be over 1,000 by fall. Okay. Well, good luck. Thank you. Yeah, please. Five-story yeah, building. We have, uh, and, and we're not considered a, a large university uh, like LSU Health Science, and we have uh, about 15,000 students across campus. So between 800 and 15,000, and you, you're talking about a huge difference in how, how we would handle yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, and and I, I honestly, I, I don't know what the answer to that would be. Uh, I think that's something that is, uh, I would have to do some research on that to see what the best approach would be, uh, what has been done previously that works, what are mm. some mm. novel ideas mm. that they work at my institution, but might not work at a smaller institution. Um, so really, a really good question that I don't think I have the answer for. Well, I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. And Carly, it is a good question. And if you have any examples that you want to throw at us, please, please do. Did you want to say that? I was just going to share one example. And again, please. this is from a small institution. We, um, when we're dealing with curriculum, we have staff and advisors that sit on our, what we call a matrix team for curriculum changes, mm -hmm. because they know how that impacts our students. Mm -hmm. And so our matrix team for a change in, um, say something in physics, involves people from all disciplines and even staff people mm -hmm. to give input mm -hmm. before it goes through that curricular stages. So that's a structural approach. Through that matrix team. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great answer. I like that. Thank you. I think people are gonna be Googling that right now. Thank you. Um, we have uh, only three minutes left, so I would just like to take the moderator's privilege and ask one quick question, uh, which is, and this is again, we only have a couple of minutes left, so they can be as quick as you like. Um, how do you see specifically the chair's role as changing over the next five or 10 years? I think that um, in, in particularly in nursing, we have had um, people stay in this position for a very long time, mm. um, which is good to have the historical background, but can also be a barrier to moving forward. So I, I, I think that um, having a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more um, different mechanism than we have now mm. For mm. individuals that are in a chair position, and I think too that we have to take into consideration um, how we're going to have to adjust to the faculty shortage, how we're going to have to adjust to uh, decreasing numbers in enrollment, decreasing finance that we are getting from the state. 
I think that we're going to have to develop unique strategies to combat all of that. And that's yeah. something that, you know, we might not have had to do before mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I first started at the university over 16 years ago, 75% of our funding came from the state and now it's less than 20%. Wow. So it is wow. a huge, I mean, you know, so what I, what I would do as a chair with a budget of 75% from the state yeah. versus less than 20% is a lot different, oh, right? So moving forward, I think we need to anticipate wow. um, changes like that and um, get, ahead of, get ahead of the changes That's for sure and be proactive. Oh, thank, I don't mean thank you for that terrible number, but thank I you know, for sharing all right, of that. Right. So that's that's quite a that's quite a role chair for the chair. Be, the chair has to be very nimble and uh, strategic. It, it is. You highlighted some of the very things I would say. You're 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 looking at different funding streams, which means partnerships, mm. collaboration. Mm. I mean, mm. I said that earlier, but we yeah. I think the chair has to look at how can I develop partnerships, not just within my institution or within and across other institutions, partnerships with the community. We have a million dollar grant from a business down the road from us that needs needs workers saying, here's how we can work together. Nice. So thinking of those collaborative pieces, in terms of state funding, if you are in a political role as a chair, mm -hmm. you will need to um, navigate conversations that maybe you wouldn't have 15 years ago. Whether you're telling mm -hmm. the story, advocating for, for the efforts and the, the vision that you have at your yeah. college and at your school, Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's become, I believe, a more political type of position than it used to be as well. I do want to say one please, more thing. Please. Um, and this is related to workforce development, particularly mm -hmm. for healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, I think a, a challenge for me over the next couple of years is also going to be for those students that may be uh, unsuccessful in a four year college, how can we transition them to a two year technical uh, college? Uh, and keep them in the workforce. So, you know, that's something we will need to, and we are looking at it uh, at a legislative level. Um, me in particular, I'm very involved with health policy at the state level and the federal level. So we are, are developing task force and work groups to see what we can do to build the workforce in mm. the state of Louisiana. Oh, that's fantastic. Those are great answers and we are out of time. Um, and so I want to, first of all, thank you both. If I get a round of applause for these two brilliant women, thank you so much. This is um, and thanks to uh, people here face to face who ask good questions uh, and shared their attention with us. Thanks to those of you who are online uh, for all of your great questions. Uh, let me just point out, uh, if you want to keep talking about this, we can use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, tweet at me, Brian Alexander Events. There's a Mastodon handle or my blog. Uh, if you'd like to dive into our previous sessions looking at things like medical education, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. If you'd like to look at some of our sessions coming up, just go to forum.futureeducation.us. Um, if you want to send me anything uh, that you've been working on that you want to celebrate, please email me. Be glad to share that. And in the meantime, thank you all for a great session. Uh, I hope everybody is well, that you stay safe, warm, and dry, depending on where you are. And we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. That was great work.